Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Seth on this amazing Tuesday. Hope it's going well for you. Hope your week's going fantastic. Uh, I have to start this off by giving a confession. I completely forgot to do a, uh, a podcast video last week because, not kidding you, last week was so busy, it was so hectic, and I had just I had so many so many things to do that had deadlines that I think it was on Friday. When I was clocking in at work, I realized that it was Friday. I'm like, "Oh wow, <laughs> holy crap!" It has been it's been a it's been a whole five days. I'm not even kidding. It flew by that quickly, so I apologize. But it was a blessing in disguise because um, I got some questions in, and I was thinking about it uh, rather than doing a topic and then answering questions. If I have questions that are sent in. The questions that we discuss will be the topics of the actual episode. I don't know if, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, I have two, technically three questions, and uh, I'm going to dive right on into them. The first question is, hey Seth, new to your videos and like them so far. Thank you so much. My question is, I just started to attend a feel-good, quote-unquote, feel-good church and as someone who was raised in a very strict and re- quote unquote reformed denomination, it's a lot of quotes here, reformed denomination in church, back at home at least, I think this church has a lot of potential to become a theologically dense and biblical oriented church. The pastor knows his Bible and theology, but doesn't show it. Oh no. <laughs> because he's trying to please the people in the church. How can I convince the pastor that together we can really turn this ship around? Oh, okay. Where do I begin? Well, first of all, how do you know that that's why the pastor is not showing it? And are, like, how, how do you know that he knows his Bible and his theology? Like, have you had a conversation with this guy? Um, that would be my first question. But, so, I, the first thing I want to say is, um, besides, you know, just the questioning, uh, of whether or not you actually know this guy or not. I kind of, I mean, I, I really appreciate you tuning into this and writing in the question and I don't want to sound like, um, I'm being harsh, but I, I would suggest that you take a step back for just a second and think about really the implications of what you're trying to do and whether or not you should be doing it. Now, I'm I'm the first guy uh, that would, you know, I, I would be rooting for you. And, you know, secretly, I am rooting for you, and I think that's a fantastic thing that you want to do. Problem with it is, is two things. Number one, you have to understand and recognize how much weight you're bringing to the table. And I'm not talking about physical weight. I'm talking about influence... And just, you know, who you are. Um, I think Douglas Wilson has this amazing illustration in his book, Rules for Reformers, which I highly recommend you read. Rules for Reformers um, kind of deals a lot with these kind of topics. He says that if you're at a circus and you're watching 12 clowns perform their clown show, and you are sitting up in the audience and you decide that you want to, uh, I don't know, do Shakespearean plays. So you jump in the middle of the ring and you just start reciting Shakespeare. While you think you're doing a good thing, while you think you're trying to accomplish your, your dream, what you're not understanding and what you're not realizing is that to everybody in the crowd, you've just become the 13th clown. Right, because you you're you're in, you're not going into that ring with enough weight to change the atmosphere, to change the culture, to change the um, the overall I don't know the overall uh, you know trajectory of what's going on. Now, if someone like a famous celebrity were to get up and start doing uh, you know Shakespearean plays, uh, even then, I think they would still get laughed at. But my point is, is that. Unless you are some big time author or you're some great, great theologian who like you're almost a household name where 
these people in the church trust you and recognize you, all your attempts of trying to quote unquote turn the ship around is they're they're just gonna laugh at you because it's like you know who who, who the heck's this guy <laughs> who's who is this guy walking in here and not to mention the fact that uh, coming like if you walk up to that pastor and you're like listen uh, you know your Bible you know your theology. And, uh, I mean, even if you said it in like the nicest way possible, even if you were just like, Hey, you know what? You know, you are a great guy. You are a great pastor. You know, you do so much Bible. You know, you're so smart about the Bible. You know, your theology and, you know, uh, and you make your case and you say, I, I really think that you should start incorporating that more. Even if you do that, I mean, he, he might take, he may take your advice that way, but it has to come from him. Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know this guy. I don't know the pastor. He could be he could be a very 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 nice guy, and you could do some good by tell by just telling him this. I would very I would think about and probably even write out how you're going to tell him, and ask you know just think it over before you just go in there and start and just tell him. I but my thing is if you walked in there and you told him, hey, I think you should start incorporating this stuff because you really know your Bible, and I think, you know, it could really 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 change some hearts, and I think people would be more fed by this if he says all right awesome and he goes out and does it and he starts getting flack for it then then that's when you can be a good uh a good member assuming that you're a member or a good congregational person and ju- and you know help uh, back him up support him be there for him and if uh if he says no thank you i, I don't want to do that then you know you have to take the next step but i, I one of the things i and judging by your profile, I, I, I would you're a younger guy like myself. One of I honestly will say this: the biggest temptation that us young guys have, especially when we get our hands on something like Reformed theology, is that we immediately think that we are the next Martin Luther. I've made that mistake. God, I've made that mistake. Uh, many of my friends who are like that have made that mistake. Some of my friends are starting to make that mistake. You, listen, Martin Luther didn't even know he was going to be the next Martin Luther. Okay, he, you, you just if, if if you're going if you're trying to nail the next ninety five theses to the door of a church or to a a, a a seminary because you want to change the theology of something, uh, it's not going to go over very well. Um, but I really appreciate what you're doing, and I, I uh, if you're from that background and you feel called to this church. You know, and you think that this is something that God wants you to do, then my my step would be um, plant the seed in the pastor's ear and just see what he does with it. You know, don't try don't try to force it. Um, God's going to God's go, God's going to do the work. But I mean, that's just that's just me. But anyways, I, I, I hope that wasn't too harsh. I hope that wasn't I hope that didn't come off the wrong way. But um, again, I, I appreciate what you're doing. But I would just be very careful on how you go about this, and just try to keep yourself humble. Uh, the next question that I have uh, simply says, and I like this question a lot, says, "When someone you know who battles really bad depression asks you when does it get better, what do you tell them?" Uh, well, as someone for my, and I don't know if you know this or not about me, but. Um, I struggle with depression. I've always have as long as I can remember. Um, I don't take any medication for it. And the only reason why that is, is because every time I've ever, um, felt the depression come on, I always try to deal with it in a very naturalistic way. And if that doesn't work, that's when I would turn to some sort of medication or something like that. So, um, you know, one thing I'll do is I'll, I'll change my diet I'll try exercising more. I'll try to be outside more. Um, and, you know, I'll talk to some friends, go out with some friends, go see a counselor, you know, take maybe two showers a day, you know, uh, wear nicer clothes, not buy new newer clothes. I'm, I'm not saying go an online shop. I'm saying, if you, you know, just, tend, you know, try to dress nicer than you usually do. Just do all those things. And if that doesn't work and you still feel like crap, then I would say take the medication because, you know, but, uh, I just always feel like I, I want to make sure I do the, um, 
the physical, natural stuff first and to see if that's the cause of it. And so far in my life, that has always worked. But um, as someone who struggles with depression, this is a question that I, it really hits home and something that's uh, very, which is sad, only a few people have ever been in this position where they've actually asked me. And um, because it's something that most people just don't want to talk about. But um, so I'll kind of change the question. If someone you know who is battling with bad depression asks you, when does it get better? What would you tell them? To answer that question uh, by rephrasing it a bit, I would simply say this, that number one, do what I just said. And that is, you know, uh, is your depression linked to something that you can fix? And which is something like changing your diet, uh, going outside more, exercising more, watching less television. And, for, and one of the things that has always, t- you know, if, if, if all, if nothing else works, one of the things that I always do almost last, even though I think it should be first, is to stop social media. Just don't go on it. Go on it every other day, you know, and limit yourself to that. And that that always works. And, you know, more than anything, whatever time that you have, like if you're going outside, listen to a sermon. Um, when you're exercising, listen to an audiobook, a Christian audiobook or a sermon. When you're at home, instead of watching TV, read a book read or listen to a sermon study the bible read your bible all these different things i uh, just do that and see if that works if it still doesn't work and you're taking medication and you're still struggling with it and people are like you know when does it ever get better my thing is this is that uh it's all it one is it's about perspective right so you, you i know people and i know this is a very controversial thing to say but I'll stand by it for as long as I live. I know people who take antidepressant medication or antidepressant medication like they're, they're Tic Tacs, and yet they still have the most negative outlook on life. And as a friend, and sometimes as a relative, I almost want to just like grab them by the shoulders and say, you are the cause of this. Because you are choosing to have the negative outlook on everything. You know, you are the one who's choosing to look for the worst in the situation. And not to mention the fact, too, that those people tend to surround themselves with, with other negative people. You know, and so what, my thing is if you, if you want it to get better, one, change your lifestyle. Okay, change your habits. Change the people who you are surrounding yourself with. Um, if, if you are someone who is a total introvert, okay, uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, but even though you don't like being social, even if you don't like going outside and you don't like meeting people, social activity, being in a community is a so, is a, is an actual psychological need. Your brain and your body need personal one-on-one time with another human being as much as your body needs fed and as much as it needs water. Um, isolation is one of the worst things you can do to yourself. And if you're around, if, if you are surrounding yourself with people who are very negative, very critical, always are looking for something to squash you for, my thing is, is, is you know, don't ditch them, but start to incorporate other positive people into your life and allow them and their, you know, allow them to uplift you. You know, do all these different things and watch how much your mood improves over time. Uh, just, just watch it. I mean, I, again, I've seen so many people, and I've even seen this in myself, where it's like, okay, I'm doing everything I can, and it's still not working. And even people who are saying, okay, I'm taking, you know, anti-depressant, uh, depressant medication. I'm taking anti-anxiety medication, but I still feel this way. And it's like, okay, but okay, but you know. Why are you hanging around that person? Well, because we've been friends forever or we're family, okay? They're not healthy for you, right? Like they're they're like social junk food. Don't don't bother yourself with that. You know, and try to keep your chin up and as a Christian, one of the things you have to understand and you have to continually feed yourself to your brain is that what we are experiencing now is nothing compared to the glories that we have waiting for us in heaven. I mean, Paul even said that. If anybody should have been depressed, it would have been Paul. 
right? It should have been Paul. But he kept his mind on heaven and Christ alone, right? He kept his heart on his eyes on Jesus, and he let Jesus and the gospel be his source of joy. And if you want a, if you want a book to read, read the book of Philippians. Read that. When you're done, read it again. When you're done, read it again. And keep doing that until you die. <laughs> Keep reading it until you die. That is a fantastic book for people who are down in the dumps and who are struggling with depression because Paul from prison is writing this letter um, and he's had a really, very, very tough life and he's writing about joy. And it's an amazing book if you want to read and get further. So um, that's what I would suggest to to those people. Um, And uh, yeah. So that's that. And then the last question, it's not really a question, but the question is, um, did you listen to slash watch the Holyfield, you know, Evander Holyfield episode with Joe Rogan? I did. I actually listened to it this morning on my way um, to work this morning. Uh, I loved it. I I was blown away. Um, If if, if you're a heavyweight or boxing, uh, sorry, heavyweight boxing or MMA fan or you just really you know the history of Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield I highly suggest that you listen to that podcast on the Joe Rogan experience either on the podcast version or the YouTube version amazing amazing testimony that Evander Holyfield shares in that and how he forgave Mike Tyson it was phenomenal I I I could have listened to three more hours of that podcast it was fantastic uh but yeah so I liked it. Thank you for uh, sending that in. I really appreciate it. Other than that, guys, that's all I have to talk about this week. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week. I will be at Faith Presbyterian Church um, every Tuesday of this month going through the book of Habakkuk. I hope you can be there at 630 um, in their... uh, I'm trying to think what the actual name of the hall is called. When you first walk in the church, it's off to your left. Um, I'll be there. Tuesday is 6.30 p.m. going through the book of Habakkuk. I am super stoked. Um, I went there, did the first chapter this past Thursday, um, and there wasn't a good turnout, so we moved it to thir- to Tuesdays. Hopefully, we'll get a better turnout. But um, other than that, have a fantastic rest of your week. I will talk to you and check up in on you, check up on you on next Tuesday. All right, guys, have a great day. Bye.